terribly slow. But I could. And what happens is that that customization script gets it is made available from the inside of the instance. The instance comes up, looks around, finds that, and does what I tell it to do. So um, that is basically what uh, that's the idea of user data. Um, and so Amazon kind of when they first had their cloud, they did this and made made you able to specify user data because if you if you've uh, once you've launched an, an instance of an image, and if you wanted to do four or five or six or seven or ten of them, well, they're all the same, right? And that's kind of boring, because why would you want something to do, why would you want to do the same thing hundreds of times? Um, so instance and user data is used for customization of that guest to make it different than the other one you launched, because maybe one you want to be the Apache server and one of them you want to be MySQL, and then somehow you hook them up. So just like in your server room or in, throughout computing history, there's lots of tools that would do that. Um, you know, you might, after you deployed a, a server or launched an instance, um, you might configure Puppet and make him join into your Puppet group. You might use Chef or Ansible, or you might just SSH to the host and app get install something and start programming. I often, that's probably my primary use of an instance. Um, Let's see. But largely, if if you're looking, and the cloud is very much about um, automation, right? And while Puppet and Chef and Ansible are about automation, they don't get you from nothing if you have to go into the system and say, okay, become part of that Chef group or you know, join up with join up with that Puppet cluster. Um, so that's where user data comes in. It's the customization bit. And so the first thing that happened on Amazon is this little simple one, shebang echo hi mom. So if, the, if your user data started with shebang, then uh, the initial initialization scripts like that first came out with Amazon stuff would execute the code at RC local like time frame. You know, basically late in boot, it would just run your code. So you can imagine that's very powerful. Just whatever you feed it, it's going to execute. And so you can, you know, make it use wget to call home to a URL or um, you can put all of your code in line there. One limitation with that, with user data on Amazon, is it is limited to 16K. It can be compressed, but 16K can very easily be filled up if you're putting all, the, all of your code inside of that. Um, a little bit more complex, and this is what CloudNet, I guess I should have introduced CloudNet. Um, then as we, as we moved on, I did some development of our, over CloudNet, moved to doing config-based user data, where you say, I want these packages installed, and I want to run this command, and type that in a paste minute, and then some that would do what it would do. I guess. I will talk first. So, so cloud init is basically the idea of okay. You want to take you want to give the user the ability to customize an instance on first boot. You want to be able to do some fancier things with it other than just shebang, um, and move towards a more of a declarative way of interacting with an instance. There, I want these things to happen. Make it happen. Kind of towards this rather than that. Um, and then also it's, it's called cloud init. Initially it was written, uh, named EC2 init, um, but as time went on, um, more cloud clouds popped up, which shouldn't have been surprising to anybody. Um, and cloud init supports getting that bit of user data, that customization data, those SSH keys, and interacting with the provider on multiple different clouds. So you can do the same stuff on Azure or Amazon or OpenStack. Da, da, da. Um, yeah, this is. I guess I meant to. Here's another example of wow. <laughs> yeah, to go. Come on now. It's 
funny. Um, I'm just going to try to show you how I... This is a wrapper around the middle of it. Um, so if you boot an instance from a command line, I mean you can, you can walk through a GUI or you can go through a command line or you can do API invocations, you know, not so doing things to a cloud, but one way or another you can see in this command line here I did put that into a file somewhere. It's obnoxious. Um, so this is just the wrapper I have around this, but you can see those are these this is the command line invocation of an instance on the cloud. You know, I'm launching an image by a user ID or by an image ID. I'm saying use the key name Bart, attach this network and give it a name. Um, and then the user data this is my typical user data. I've just customized it over time. But, um, and in this particular one, I, the launch and stuff, I, I like to record how long between, between the time I launched the instance to it ran my code. And on our cloud inside Internally, that's like 22 seconds from me saying go to the cloud, the cloud provisioning an instance, instance booting, pulling my code from user data and running it. So it, it's really, yeah, really nice. Um, so, and, and since I work on cloud at any time, I'm interested in, that, in how long that typically takes and things, but because we're interested in making our boot as fast as possible. So where was that booting? I mean, was that in a Amazon cloud or was it? That's on that's on our internal one, um, server stack and canonical. It's in, just internal for us. But um, I mean, you can that user data basically times from go. It you know it, it puts the seconds that you launched it at and then runs the code that records the difference. Um, yeah, I mean they differ widely on cloud to cloud. Clearly on provisioning time and performance, you can go from. 22 is 22 seconds from go, from boot to from request to go is faster than any of the public clouds that I'm aware of. Um, I think Dream or DreamHost. No, what's that? DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean. Yes, very good. The, <laughs> they advertise widely at at one point. You know, 55 seconds from deploy to to creation, but I think. In my recent experience, that is not that fast anymore. But that's. Um, but anyway, yeah. I mean, they and that might they vary widely across vendors. I don't want to say what I think of different vendors, but you know, it 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 very varies very widely from you know a minute to several minutes. And, um, and if you're interested in getting the most out of your instance time or on your compute time, that you know that matters. Because typically speaking, you start paying as soon as you say go, not as soon as it starts running your code. Um, let's see. So as I said, the initial user data was just basically if it started with shebang, it'd run it, otherwise it'd ignore it. And CloudNet kind of took that to another level where you could have multi-part input, so you could have multiple scripts inside there. Um, it utilizes MIME, which is somewhat arcane, arguably, uh, but, but you probably use every day, even though you might consider it arcane, as it encapsulates all your email. Um, so you can then, instead of one single user data bit, you can you know combine multiple parts into that archive, and then CloudNet will strip them apart and operate on, on them as if they one by one. Um, and then also I added pound include supports where, because of that restriction of 16K on Amazon, even if you compress, it's not all that much data. Um, so CloudNet will, if one of those parts is 
starts with pound include, it will include the contents of a URL, pull it in, and act as if it was inline. So then you can build up more can, more functional. And that, that does it into the 16K? Well, they, I mean, the word include does, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, can, it can suck down a megabyte. Yeah, right, and it'll pull it in and just process it just as it is. Just so, just like, for the same reasons you would actually use pound include in C, you would use pound include there. You know, and then you can reuse those things more easily if you have configuration bits. Um, CloudNet tries to mix both configuration and code <coughs> together to allow you to kind of, to allow you to do something like I showed here, where this would be kind of configuration and do that at the same time. So that my multi-part allows you to put those two things into one blob, and then I can run a program at the end and I can do these things, and these will just go together. Um, Cloud and it, the intent, it's, it has a configuration on disk that you can configure how Cloud and it works. And in almost all cases, you can configure how cloud and it works from the user data. So, which means I try to make cloud and it be as customizable as possible, and everything that you can do, configure it via user data. So, you can reuse a stock image as much as possible. Because a stock image is configured one way, and you don't really want to rebuild your image with a different configuration file or some such inside it. So hopefully you can do everything you want from user data. If you want to change the behavior of CloudNet, you can change the behavior of CloudNet. If you want to install packages, you can do that. You want, whatever you want to do, the goal is to be able to be able to do that without remastering an image, because that's painful. Um, CloudNet supports as input to its user data. Um, you can gzip the content, you know, my multi-part. A user script, if it starts with shebang, it'll execute it. You include cloud config as a language. You can, if you include an upstart job, it'll write it down in NC in it. Um, and then upstart will handle it. Um, a boot hook is just something that runs very early as opposed to a user script which runs late. And then also a part handler. That's kind of, part handler is a, you actually pass in Python code and then